25. It's on the screen, but if you don't, uh, uh, if, if you don't have your Bible, but if you do have your Bible, just follow with me and let's, uh, let's hear together God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. Honour widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. And not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. Thank you. We, thank we praise you. We can come to you in prayer. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints. We thank you that you are a, a prayer answering God. We thank you that you are a God who knows exactly what's going on. You aren't a God who is remote. You don't sit in an ivory, ivory tower, but you are a God who is a very present help. In, not just in times of need, but you, O oh God, are uh, omnipresent and you are all knowing as well. Lord, we thank you that we are only bringing to you things that you already know. But, Lord, we humble ourselves in bringing them before you, and you delight to receive them. You delight to hear your children coming. We think of a, a parent delighting to hear about a child, telling them about their day. Uh, we think of a, a grandparent delighting to see the, the, the toddler taking their steps. Lord, you delight to have your children come to you in a childlike manner. And Lord, we again, we acknowledge in and of ourselves, we have nothing. Lord, what, what have we off to offer? But what we do, Lord, is we come and we just cast ourselves upon you and we just say, Abba, Father. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that uh, we can share matters for prayer. We thank you in our own prayer life. We can be praying for one another. And Lord, we can testify to the grace that is given when the blessing of praying for others how we are able to look outwards, not just think about ourselves, but we can look outwards. And Lord, we must confess that so often we forget to pray for others. So often, Lord, we forget to pray for the persecuted church. And yet we're to pray for them, we're to, we're to pray for them regularly, consistently, constantly. Because there's brothers and sisters even now who are paying with their lives to name the name of Christ or to not uh, go back on their confession of faith. Ever it has been the case, Lord, the, uh, the church has grown out of the, uh, the, 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 the blood of the martyrs, as it were, Lord. Ever it has been the case. And yet, Lord, whether we are free to meet together or whether we're in a society that is, uh, prohibits us, Lord, whatever our situation, what we know is that, Lord, you are in total control. You are sovereign. You are king. And so we thank you, Lord, that even as your children now, we can pray not just for ourselves, not just for this nation, but for your church around this globe. 
And uh, Lord, we do pray for our nation because we are in this society for such a time as this. And Lord, we pray for the government and we pray for our society and we would acknowledge, Lord, that in so many aspects, our society is, is it's a, it's a husk of a society. In so many aspects, it's past its best. And yet, we are in this society and there are still your children who are praying and serving and God, you are still able. And so we pray for our nation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would have mercy upon it and we pray for your church. We pray that you would revive your church and that, Lord, that your church would have go from strength to strength. Lord, we read about... Um, the Apostle Paul, and we read about the trials and tribulations and persecutions he faced. And yet we read also, Lord, about the realities, the eternal realities that he enjoyed. And he was able to say that these light afflictions are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. And so our God and our Father, we pray, show us the Lord Jesus afresh. May eternal things be some, become so clear that then we are able to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom, that we are able to realize then that these weeks will soon pass and one day we will be called to give an account. Oh Lord, please help us to roll up our sleeves and labor for you whilst it is day. We pray for those who are working in the NHS. We thank you for them. We thank you that they will, they will be able to minister to people who are poorly and sick. We think of the pressures that they will face. We think of the difficulties at times, uh, perhaps, that they will, will uh, cause them, naming the name of Christ. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Lord, the winner of souls is wise, that they would have discretion and discernment. We pray for those who are teachers. Lord, we're in an anti-authoritarian society, and that's shown in the parenting and in the children that are coming up in so many ways. Lord, we don't just pray for the children, we pray for the parents. We pray for the parents of this church. Teach us, Lord, how to parent. Thank you that there is a pattern, that you are our heavenly father and that you do all things well. But Lord, we would acknowledge we don't do all things well. Please, oh God, help the church to pray for and get alongside young families. We think of the young family that have gone to Coventry and whose uh, the, the granddad is and had a stroke. Lord, the dynamics there, we pray that you would just give great grace in that situation. We think of those who are uh, at the other end of the age scale. We think of those who perhaps are, uh, the aches and pains are getting more numerous each day. And perhaps as well, they can see their own children or grandchildren and an old head on old shoulders, knowing that there's, uh, perhaps there's things that they're doing which they think they can see the, the obstacles ahead. And maybe they have to keep quiet or maybe they can just pray. Lord, we pray for the older people, Lord. We pray that they would run the race with endurance right to the very end of the finish line. We think of the, uh, the Olympics this summer and the 100 metres. And it was won by a no, a no, uh, uh, such a small margin because he ran right to the end of the finish line. Lord, we pray that we would run with endurance right to the end. Thank you that your grace, Lord, you are pouring out your grace and you're not stingy with your grace and you don't forget and you don't, uh, Lord, it doesn't dry up. It doesn't, Lord, uh, you do, we're not forgotten and, uh, Lord, those who are perhaps uh, housebound, chairbound maybe even, yet you don't, Lord, stint on the grace that you give them. Your grace is sufficient and thank you for those older people who are able to testify that in uh, their uh, later years where perhaps the difficulties are different, perhaps the trials are new and not even thought of before, yet your grace is sufficient. We thank you, O oh God, that you are a God who has our back, back. You are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is trustworthy. We pray, Lord, for uh, the, 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 um, uh, the ministries of the church. It's a new academic year, Lord. There's a sense of expectancy. We pray for the children going into the new academic year. We pray for the, the tab kids. It was the first one back this today. Uh, Lord, we pray for that ministry. We pray, oh Lord, that uh, in this coming year, the children of the church, Lord, that they would taste and see that the Lord is good. That, Lord, there would be encouragement to the parents. 
We pray for the parents, Lord. We pray that they would be signposts to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the members of the church, Lord. We, we think of those members who have gone on with the Lord now. We were with you, Lord, in, in, in heaven. And we, we think of the examples of so many and what we learned and what we owe to their example and their, their, their being signposts. And we pray for each person in this church, Lord, who is naming the name of Christ, that, Lord, you would enable them to be good examples. And, Lord, where we make mistakes, because we do, because we're sinners, that, Lord, we would have that gift of repentance to say sorry. Lord, we thank you that oftentimes you bring us into a situation where we learn something new about ourselves. And, Lord, uh, Lord so we pray that you would show us more of ourselves, but then show us more of Christ. And that we would be being conformed being made more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that this fellowship would be known as a fellowship where people are becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the gift of repentance. We pray that we would have not hard hearts or crusty hearts, but that there would be that uh, freshness, that vitality in our Christian life where we are encountering you each day. We pray that we would have things to share Things to testify of your goodness. Thank you for those things that we do have. Lord, even this past week we acknowledge you have been so good. Even in the midst of difficulties. Even in the midst of trials. Even in the midst of temptations. Even in the midst perhaps of you withdrawing yourself. Lord, thank you that even for those people who are in that situation, they are learning to trust in a withdrawing God. Lord, you give us not what we want, but what we need. And we find that you are a good God, even though the accuser would say otherwise, even though the world would say otherwise, even though the flesh would try to rear its ugly head, yet we can say, you are a good God. Your goodness and mercy endures forever. And we thank you, O oh Lord, then, for the church, the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, we can confess we are a ragtag bunch, but we are yours. And we thank you that your grace is at work. And we pray, O oh God, that more and more you would mould us and shape us and sculpt us and grow us to become the people that we are meant to be. And we look to that day when we will be presented before the groom, a bride fit for the Lord Jesus Christ. What beauty, what holiness. Oh, God, our Father, we look to that day and we long for that day. Continue with us for the rest of this service. We just thank you for the privilege of worshipping you because there is no one else. You alone are God and by your grace we can call you our Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Well, well uh, Vincent is away in September. I'll, uh, God willing, be uh, leading the evening services. And we're going to continue with 1 Timothy. And uh, we're, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we're going to look at the second part this evening. So we're looking at verses 9 to 16. 1 Timothy, 9, uh, 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 to 16. Uh, now, it's all within the chapter of, uh, to do with widows. And... Um, if you remember, you may not remember, but uh, it was the end of July last time we were together uh, for the evening. Uh, we looked at what the, the Bible has to say about widows. The, the Old Testament, uh, the father, the son while he was on this earth. And uh, what our attitudes towards widows and widows within the church ought to be. And uh, that was up to uh, verse 8. And it's part of the same passage, but there is a slight difference in verses uh, 9 to 16. So the, the verses 3 to 8 was looking very much at uh, the, the responsibility of family towards widows. So the responsibility uh, that if, um, that, that basically um, the family members are to step up. Now, the, these are principles. There are always uh, specific contexts, specific circumstances. Uh, this isn't a legalistic thing by any stretch. But at the same time, there are principles here in terms of um, not being a burden unnecessarily on the church. Uh, the opportunity to serve and to show love 
to those uh, of the, the, the later generation and to serve in this way. You know, uh, God isn't a taskmaster. God doesn't give us more than we can bear. Uh, we're not to be stoic. We're not to kind of just try and hold on. That isn't what we're meant to, we're meant to do. So here, very much, Paul was, would be encouraging the rest of the church to support that person who is to step up, or that family that is to step up for the widow. But nevertheless, uh, a support, not a substitute. So uh, that's a, a good lesson in, in general. And remember, these principles can be applied more widely. We're looking very much at the, uh, the area of widows, but of course those principles that we're looking at can be applied more widely. So what's the difference between what we've just, we looked at at the end of July and these verses to do with now? Well, um, and you might th see this as splitting hairs. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But uh, some would say what we're, where we're coming to now is, a is talking and tackling about a, um, a group. So it says in verse 9, uh, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. And some would say that number is a kind of recognized group of spiritual ninja widows, okay? Uh, a kind of early nun system going on. Um, uh, so, you know, they would say, uh, I've kind of lost myself, never mind, I've gone off on a tangent in my mind, never mind, these kind of, no, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of serving, in terms of a recognised body of, uh, of widows who would be, as it were, church workers, and they would be recognised, and they would have responsibilities, and they would receive re remuneration from the church for that, and it would be a specific group. And uh, I don't know if you read uh, commentaries, uh, you know, uh, it depends how you study the Bible. It can be very helpful to have, as you read a commentary, to, uh, as you read a, a book, to have a commentary, a book of the Bible, to have a commentary alongside. That can be very helpful. There's always dangers. That's uh, another, another night's discussion. Uh, but if, for example, if you've uh, ever looked at something, somebody like John Stott on Timothy, very helpful on the pastoral epistles, uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, very helpful. And he takes this view that this was really to do with an, an order, uh, a, a group, a recognised group, who were basically now in service. And it was to do with criteria about whether you take them into service or not. I, I don't think that this is what is Paul is saying here. Okay? You may take that, and that's fine. It's, not a, it's not, certainly not an essential. <laughs> this isn't a red line to which you'll be disfellowshipped. Far from it. Okay? And don't disfellowship me because I take a different view if that's the case. I think this is more to do with now, uh, my understanding of it is more to do with now the church's response to widows. So the first part was more to do with the family's response to the situation. Uh, that perhaps they find themselves in, where there's a widow who needs support. Remember, the widows being the most vulnerable, the ones that the society would cast aside. Here now is the, there's no safety net, there's no welfare society in, in this day and age. And uh, they've, they've committed themselves to the church, they're following the Lord Jesus Christ. This is now where the family is to, is to, is to put their money where their mouth is and show Christ in their uh, sacrificial service and care. For the elderly. Now I think this passage we're coming up to, the emphasis now is on the church to step up. So previously we we mentioned about the church supporting those who are um, caring for the elderly, supporting perhaps the families that are in this situation. Now we're looking at more. What if there isn't a family member? What if there aren't family members around that widow? What if that widow is absolutely all alone? What then? This is where the church steps up. And uh, in a sense, it's high fences because Paul here is saying that it seems almost that there's quite a lot of, there's quite a strict criteria before this, uh, these people can be taken into the number. And uh, the reason being is because, of course, uh, there's limited resources. You know, uh, the, 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 the church, remember in Acts, the church um, pooled their resources, and some understand that to be 
a kind of co almost communal communism type thing. It, it wasn't. That was of its day. It's descriptive, a description of what's going on. It's not prescriptive in terms of, therefore, we should all sell everything and, and kind of live together. That's certainly not what the, what, uh, the, the, the word is telling us here. But there was that sense in which, remember it said, and all, uh, all needs were met. Remember in Acts 6 where uh, they have to choose uh, men filled of the Spirit, the early de deacons, isn't it, to go and, uh, and meet the, the, the needs of people so that it was organised. So this is really, the reality is that the, the resources were stretched in terms of there was so much need. And so there needs to be discrimination. Uh, there needs to be um, a sense in which the church's provision doesn't cause individuals to uh, the church's taking responsibility doesn't cause other individuals to abdicate their responsibility. So Paul is treading a really fine line here. Now we see this in the welfare system, don't we, in our, in our society. And you see politically people taking polarised views. You see those people who say the individual must take responsibility. And if you give people welfare, then they will just lose their dignity and they won't work themselves. But then you see another, uh, another uh, uh, political kind of, uh, uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of, uh, side where people say, but uh, people are born in different circumstances and people face different difficulties. And do you know what it's like to be born with, um, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a difficult situation? And people need to be helped. As society, we should be helping one another. Okay? And, I mean, that's a very broad brushstroke. So the point being is, people can see it from different angles. And the reality is, without, those ex without extremes, the reality is there's a tension. The church is to step up. The church is to take its responsibility. The worst of churches, can you imagine? Come in, come in, join our church. But then when there's any need, we kind of find that uh, everybody scarpers. There's no support. We'll take your money, but when there's some need, you're on your own. That's not the church, is it? Far, far, you know, God forbid. But equally so, neither is it, we're going to do everything for you. You just sit there. You put your feet up. Because there's a dignity. There's every, every person is, 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 there's a dignity. And you can unwittingly take away somebody's dignity by doing too much, as it were. Now, again, we're just looking broad brush strokes. We're not doing specifics. But there is a sense then in terms of, uh, with, with here, uh, that um, uh, Paul is, has these fences high, but then when that person is taken into the number, they are really looked after. So, why is this important? Well, because in that day and age, you know, there wasn't the welfare system. They, 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 they would have been. They, they, it, was a, it was a kind of a life and death type thing. You know, it was very, very serious. But, of course, it was a witness. It was a witness for the, uh, that uh, not only were these people... Uh, there, there was something behind what they were saying. Uh, they, 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 they put their money where their mouth was, if, if you will. You know, see how they love one another. When a group of people who perhaps are, are different, not just family, uh, but, but spiritual family, but when there's a group of people and they care for each other, different personalities, different situations, but there's that care and love. We were saying to the children this morning about the love of God. And the Apostle John says, doesn't he? This is how you distinguish yourselves, that you love one another. This is a distinguishing feature of Christianity. That Christians love one another. And that love is not just skin deep. That love, as we'll learn, God willing, with the children, is there's a depth to it. It matters. And so here is an opportunity for the, for the, for the church, rather than viewing of it like, oh, here's another person we're going to have to kind of help out. Oh, they're going to pull us down. They're going to be a bane on us. No, not at all. Here is an here is opportunity for us to step up. He's already dealt with the fact that um, if there are children, let them, that they take first precedent, let them fulfill responsibility. 
don't pull away the opportunity for service for them. And also, service, uh, resources aren't infinite. But if this person, if this uh, widow is truly alone, now church, step up. And step up royally. Be there. Not just the bare minimum. Be that second mile people. Not just miserly. Not stingy. Not just doing things to kind of satisfy your conscience. Not just doing things to look good. Not a photo opportunity. But be there. Absolutely. Be there and be there uh, for them. That is Christianity. The Christian life. You know, there may come a time when to... Uh, we're already seeing it. And, and, and sometimes there are those people who, who perhaps... I don't know, there can be a scaremongering aspect maybe or there can be a, a fearfulness that comes. There may be a time when there's a real cost in terms of jobs, people's jobs, to, to be a Christian. Not that they're going, you know, trying to get themselves arrested or anything daft like that, but that there may be a real cost to simply following the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's nothing new under the sun because the churches in Revelation were in exactly the same situation. There were guilds, unions that people couldn't join because it was pagan. And then they couldn't get work because they weren't in the unions. When the world looks on, do we step up? You know, does the church step up? So Paul is saying here that this is an opportunity now. Take them into the number. What does that mean? Well, it's organised. I think sometimes we have a view of Christian service that unless it's completely chaotic and we're going by the seats of the pants, this isn't real Christian service. There's nothing wrong in being organised. <laughs> Equally so, we're an organism, not an organisation. But here, they're, they're organised. The person is on a list. The person isn't missed. One of the things that keeps me up at night at times, not literally, but it is on my mind a lot, is, and maybe some are going, amen, brother. I feel sometimes we can fall through the cracks. We can slip, be slipped. We can be, be missed. Well, things happen, don't they? But nevertheless, here, there's something of an organization, organizational aspect. And there's a principle there's a principle here because, look, as we go on, let's move it on, let's push it on a little bit. Verse 9, so uh, not a window under, under 60. In other words, this is someone who really is need, uh, needy, if you will. There's a vulnerability. Uh, they're, 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 uh, uh, and, and the church now steps up and fulfills its responsibility. But look, neither is this just without lack of discernment. Verse 10. She, well, end of verse 9, not unless she's been the wife of one man. And again, when you're reading this, it can sound a certain way, can't it? But actually, when you look at it, it it's, it's wonderful. It's very pastoral. In other words, that this, uh, per, this, this person, this widow who is now going to be supported and really cared for and really given resources, as it were, this person is, it's not, it's not a flyby night. It's someone who has a track record. In other words... In other words, it's a bit similar to marriage. You see, marriage is an intimate thing, isn't it? And it's meant to be, God has given it because it's a picture of the bride of Christ and the church. And in a marriage, it's possible to not commit. Think of a person going in for a tackle, and they go in for the tackle, but they don't commit. They pull out the tackle. And in a marriage, it's possible to not commit in terms of loving the other person. It's possible to think about yourself. It's possible to kind of have barriers up emotionally. It's possible to kind of... You, you're in a marriage, but there's a distance. It's possible to think, but if I commit, the other person may take advantage. Now, the best of marriages is where... That person commits. And that person commits. And it's slightly scary. Because you could fall. But you don't. And then Christ is the centre, isn't he? That's the best of marriages. And in a sense, it's a similar here. You see, here's, for argument's sake, then this, 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 uh, this woman. Here's this widow. 
And look at her track record. Look at what's, what she's done. She's been faithful in her marriage. She's well reported for good works. If you think of Dorcas or Tabitha, she kind of fits the bill in, in Acts. I can't remember what it, Acts it is. Somewhere in Acts. Um, she's, um, she's, she's got a track record. She's, she's well reported for good works. She's brought up her children in a godly manner. She's lodged strangers. She's washed the saints' feet. Not that... You know, that's not that... I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ himself washes the saints' feet. So it's not like, oh, that's a woman's job. No, no, not a bit of it. The point is this. this she's been... She's served. Not she's done her time. Not she's paid into the pension and now she gets it out. But there is a sense in which, while she was able, she served. Now she's in a situation where she's not able. So what do we do? Throw her on the scrap piece of paper and say, thanks very much. No, no, not a bit of it. Now's our turn. Now's our turn to, to, to get alongside and to, and to show love. And so she leans in like that. And what does the church do? Take a step back so she falls flat? No, no, the church leans in. And there's a beautiful relationship there. And again, remember, these, we're talking about widows. We're talking about the ones that the world would say, past the best. What value can they add to society? They're not going to boost the economy, the GDP. Leave them be. But the church says those that are the least honourable in the world sight, we honour the most. And so the church honours. And yet it's not a naivety. There's not a naivety there. It's not this kind of unthinking, naive view. Paul is absolutely pin sharp in his thinking. Because what does he say about the younger widows? Presumably in that day and age... We, we think of Ruth, yeah, the Moabites. In that day and age, although that was many years earlier, but even in that day and age, there would have been young women who'd lost their husbands. Perhaps there was no children now. We, do, we don't know the situation. But Paul says, uh, and in the Greek originally, it's very, very curt. It's young widows, no chance. <laughs> young widows, no chance. Why? Because he's absolutely, he's realistic. You know, there's that, there's that phrase, isn't there? Too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. I don't know what that's trying to say, but the point is, Christians, the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly use you are. You think of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was absolutely shrewd. In fact, we're told, aren't we, to be shrewd as a serpent, wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. And he knows. He knows that they've still got a life to live. Have you ever come across those people who were perhaps in their 30s, but they look as though they could be in the... I think of... Not that I ever watched it, but not really. The Last of the Summer Wine. And there were some younger characters, weren't there, amongst the old women drinking the tea. And they, they looked like they were ready for retirement, and they were only in the 30s. Old before the time. And Paul is saying here... He's not quoting The Last of the Summer Wine, is he? By any stretch. But what he is saying is he's saying, look, the younger widows... Clearly, it was, if you're coming into this fold, if you're coming into this number, there's a kind of commitment. What are you going to commit to? You're, going to, you're leaning into the church. What are you committing to? You're committing to, you're going to pray. Maybe there's a commitment to pray for the church. You can't do this, but this is what you can do. This is where you can serve. Maybe there was a kind of a commitment in terms of a vow or, a, or an oath. We, we don't know. What we do know is this, Proverbs 20 verse 25 says, it is a snare for a man or a woman to devote rashly something as holy and afterward to reconsider his vows. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, there's a young widow. She shouldn't be making any long-term decisions at this point in time. And the church shouldn't be unwise in this. She's got a whole life ahead of her. If she can marry, if she desires to, let her crack on. Because she has still an area of service that isn't there for that older lady. It's very down to earth, isn't it? It's very common sense. If she can, it's not, she can be a wife and she can keep home and she can be put in a place. No, not a bit of it. It's, this is the area that she can serve. This is the area. This is her age and stage. She's not at that stage yet. So don't, don't let her put herself rashly 
in that stage. She's still at an age and a stage where can she, she can serve the Lord in this area. So encourage her to. Encourage her to love the Lord. Encourage her to, to get remarried. Encourage her to serve. That's what she can do. And he's obviously, he obviously knows people. Because what's happened? Verse 11. The danger you see. You know, every age and stage, there's pitfalls in the Christian life. Maybe you're young and you think, well, I'll grow out of this. Maybe you do. But then there's another thing that comes along. Another worry, another care, another sin, another thing that inhibits, hinders your spiritual growth. Sometimes we can be too polite in the wrong sense. Sometimes we can not talk about these things and actually we're not being real. Paul here is very, can we use that phrase, real? And what does he say? He says, well, they put themselves... Now, remember, we've already referred to those who, were say, who have said uh, you're to abstain from getting married. And he says, actually, do you know what? That's the wrong thing. We've already covered that in the letter, haven't we? So here we are, he says, listen... These younger wid widows, they make a rash decision. They, they come into a situation. They can't back out of it. They, they're left with egg on their face. But all of a sudden, what's the dangers? A couple of dangers. One, they begin to resent the situation they're in. They begin to want to get married. They begin to kind of not want to be in this, in this situation. The other thing, of course, is they begin to learn bad habits. If habits were shoes... Good habits are like Doc Martin lace-ups they take an hour to put on. Bad habits are like slip-ons. Easier to learn bad habits than it is to learn good habits, isn't it? And the thought is here that this, these younger women, they've got the hormones, they've got the energy, they've got the stage of life, and they're there and they're learning what it is to just be idle. There's the older woman. It takes her all her energies to get from A to B. She's not being idle, she's being out of breath. There's a younger woman. Oh, but she's learning idleness. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Why? Well, because she's learning bad habits. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? Everybody in the church can be used for good by the Lord or can be used for Ill, Ill by the evil one. Everybody can be used for real. And so Paul is just saying, no, don't put, them in, don't put them in that situation. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable to the accuser. He'll know what buttons to press. And all you'll end up with is someone who then causes problems. Someone then who isn't where they should be. And he says it's already happened. In case he th we think he's being a bit OTT, what's he saying? For some have already turned aside after Satan. Now, whether it's those who have remarried and have just not, not followed the Lord. So what, what have we got in this? The point is this. Every age and stage, you've, sometimes you've got to get your head around. This is, I'm at a new stage of life. You know, I remember once years back, somebody said, we're not young anymore. It was a, a, a mate of mine who's in the ministry. And uh, I thought to myself, well, I still am young. I mean, never mind that. But the reality is, we're different age and stages. You know, I remember my wife and I talking one time, we're not newlyweds anymore. We're in a different age, a different stage. And uh, there's a sense in which you think of people who are becoming retired from work. That can take a lot of adjustment. And there's a sense in which we're to understand and realise different ages and stages. Why does that matter? Well, because whatever age or stage we are in, we can serve the Lord. Sometimes we can give the impression that the only way you can serve the Lord is by standing from the front and preaching. Or the only way you can serve the Lord is what you can do. What can you do for the church? Therefore, you're of high value. No, 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 no. Every age and stage, whether we're young or whether we're old, whether we're gifted or whether we're infirm, whatever age or stage, we can be obedient. But we need to be in the right situation. And here Paul is saying it's not just left to the individual 
as a, those in oversight, remember he's addressing Timothy, the pastor of the church, those in oversight, look ahead, see the obstruction, see the danger, don't allow somebody to get themselves into it. They're, they're, they're heading for a, and that's a difficult thing, isn't it? When do you say something to somebody? Well, this is about a church business, so you should say something. If it's somebody's private business, maybe you don't. Maybe you keep quiet. That's, you need wisdom. But the reality is, every age and stage, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to serve. Maybe, I don't know, let's go off on a tangent. It's, it's, it's about time. Uh, maybe there's some of you here who say, oh, that was the good old days. I could give out those leaflets 100 an hour, even on the hills. Yeah? I can't do that anymore. Well, we need to embrace the, the age and stage we are in. Lord, what would you have me to do? Because you can absolutely, if there's breath in your body, there's things you can do for the Lord. Lord, I can't do anything. Can you pray? What the church owes to the prayers of the saints. What the church owes to the prayers of old women. Revivals that have come as a result of women praying together. So the positive, what can I do, Lord? Never mind what I used to do. In this situation, or never mind what I'd like to do. And that's hard, isn't it? You have responsibilities. Maybe you have kids. Maybe you're a mother. Maybe you were used to going off on beach missions and now you've got sprogs around you and you think I'm being limited here. Maybe your husband tries to help, but you still feel limited. Okay, this is the situation God has placed you in. This is what you can do. What can you do in this situation? Positive. But then remember, there's an enemy afoot. Now, why would... So recently, in fact, it was yesterday, um, the wider family has had a, a number of car issues. Uh, anyway, yesterday we had a phone call from uh, my uh, in-laws and they were broken down. A newish car had broken down. And uh, seemingly a bolt hadn't been put back properly when there was a, a belt change or something. I don't know, I've exhausted my mechanical knowledge already. Uh, but the point being, is it just a little bolt causing a heck of a lot of problems? Why does this matter? Because in a sense, the, the church, it's an organism. Change illustration, it's an engine. Lots of little moving parts. That's why we need the oil of the Holy Spirit, otherwise we'll grind on each other, yeah? But a little bolt, someone's got a screw loose somewhere. Someone's put in the wrong situation. Someone's exposed uh, to a difficult, the, the evil one gets in and straight away, there he's going to target. And what happens? The big end goes, whatever that means. There's problems, the crankshaft breaks, the head gasket blows. In other words, there's an enemy. So are these things relevant? Surely we want to be talking, why are we talking about these things? Well, because the point being is, we're a family. And there are family issues. We're a church, and it doesn't just sort itself out. We don't just look to the Lord and everything sort itself out. No, no, we trust the Lord, but he's given us his word. And he's given us wisdom. He's given us the truth. And we're to apply this truth in our lives. You know the person who says, but I'm always struggling. I'm always struggling with a certain sin. But then you look at their lifestyle and you say, well, no wonder. No wonder you're always struggling because look at your life. There's a situation with someone. In other words, you see these things that on the, on the surface you think, really? Boring? Are they? I don't know. But actually they're important. There are principles at stake. You know, um, in our lives there's extremes. We're not to have too hard a life. The Lord hasn't called us to walk on broken glass. Sometimes we can equate, we think, the harder the life, the more godly. No. That's, that's a false view of, of God. But neither are we to go after too soft a life. Actually, we've been called to serve him. There will be hardships. We need to embrace that. And we can't always be going self-indulgent. That's not right. So here, you see, there's provision for those that need it. And absolutely, step up. But then, do they need it? If not... Go a different path, different route. Fulfill your responsibility. And there you have that beautiful tension. The individual's responsibility. The church's support. 
How do we apply that in our own lives? Well, the same principles apply in church life. Do we in our prayers go through individual... This is for those in oversight first and foremost, isn't it? Absolutely. But each member now, in our, in our prayer life, do we go through each person, as we begin to think about each person, when we came in through that door, did we think that person's going to have had a tough week this week because their mother-in-law's unwell, for example? That person's raw because it's, it's their, the, the anniversary of their dad's death. In other words, we're a collection of individuals and we're looking out for one another and we're being outward looking towards each other and we're seeking to be kind to each other and we're not always giving, we're sometimes receiving but we're not always receiving, we're sometimes giving because if we're always giving and we're never receiving, we're proud but if we're always receiving and never giving we're selfish. And this is what we've been called to. What's the point of the church? It's to call people in to, to get them Christians. Yeah, amen. Build the church up. But the point of the church in this instance is that we will fitly be joined together. We will be like an engine. We'll be well oiled. Not never having difficulties. No far from it. You take out a car, it, does a nice t it, it goes nice for me to be in the car park, okay. But what's that car like going up a hill? Or what's that car like in the wet? The situations we find ourselves in, God's in con absolute control. He allows members to be unwell. He allows things to happen. Nothing happens outside of his control. But when we put these principles in place, and this is just one of many, isn't it? When we put these principles in place, what happens is that as we're under stress, as we're under difficulty, yet we don't sink. Underneath are the everlasting arms. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where a church comes into its own. People look on. See how they love one another. See how they support one another. It's not just on the surface. It's not just with that Colgate smile. It's when the, it's when the going gets tough. With sanctified common sense. Not dramatic. Not with hair all in a mess. Hair is always immaterial, but... Point being is, just quietly in a way, living the Christian life. And here, with widows, to whom most of the world would just pass on and say, move on. Here with widows, this is the opportunity to show Christ. To show love. The love of Christ in action. And who knows but on that day, what the Lord will say, thank you. You showed love to them. If we're showing love to them, it means we're showing love to him. If we're not showing love to them, then we can forget it that we're showing, if we think we're showing love to God. Okay, let's leave it at that. Amen. Right, let's sing our final song and then uh, we'll have a brew. Thank you.